Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the investment meeting of the Teachers Retirement Board for May 9th, 2024. We're going to start by Corin Lavelle. Kevin Lynn. Kevin Lynn. Kevin Lynn. Kevin Lynn. Thomas Brown. Good morning, Patricia. Good morning. Anthony Giordano. Allison Hirsch. Uh, present on behalf of Controller Bradley. David Gazanski. Present. Victoria Lee. Present. Kim Kwan, alternative chair. Great, good morning, everybody. And we'll start with uh, Passport Funds March 2024 performance review and Robert Tom. Take it away. Thank you. Okay. Is there enough screen here? Um, so, um, the screen we have the uh, results of the passport funds through the end of March, um, and the first quarter really was a continuation of the very strong markets we saw at the end of 2023. Um, so, within equities, we um, continued to see um, tech, uh, some of those big tech stocks, the Magnificent Seven, um, leading a lot of those returns, particularly uh, NVIDIA that has benefited from a lot of the continued optimism um, around uh, AI and the prospects uh, around AI. Uh, we saw several equity indices reaching all-time highs during the first quarter. Um, and on the fixed income side, uh, the Fed um, has continued to keep uh, rates flat and has continued to signal expectation for beginning of rate, in, uh, rate decreases later this year, um, although the timing of that um, is still uh, debatable, of course. Um, in terms of the results of your passport funds um, for uh, the month of March, all, all positive across asset classes in kind of the low single digits um, across both uh, equities and, and fixed income. Um, and I would highlight in particular for um, the three months ended March, as well as the one year, but very strong results for uh, the diversified equity fund uh, for the one year up over 25%. Um, and we had particularly very strong results from your uh, active equity managers, uh, both on the US and international side, but particularly within the US where that active equity sleeve outperformed its benchmark by more than 5% on the trailing one year. Um, so um, on, the, on the whole there, the um, diversified equity fund outperformed its benchmark by uh, close to close to uh, 40 base points there. Um, the strongest performing fund over the year was the sustainable equity uh, fund, which was up over thir over 34%, close to 35% on the year. Didn't quite keep pace with that uh, benchmark, which was up 39%. Although that uh, Russell 1000 growth index has been incredibly hard to beat over the last year, given how uh, much exposure it has to some of those big, big tech names that have been uh, really driving some of the strongest equity market results this year. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there on, on the passport funds for March, unless there's any questions. Questions for a moment. Okay. Now we move on to the April 2024 market performance update. And I'm not sure you have just yeah. good news. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the numbers, I'll say, I'll say the numbers are not good but we took a sort of different message from the volatility we saw in April. Um, so the, just at a high level, the US equity market was down about 4.4%. Uh, the hybrid benchmark for the, the diversified equity fund was down about 3.8%. Both benchmarks down about 3.8%. So we saw still negative performance for the non-US equity markets, but a little bit less negative than what we saw in the US. Um, to us, when we look at the volatility we saw in the month of April, it was really the markets catching up to uh, the, the likelihood that rate cuts would be pushed out to be much later this year, if at all, later this year. 
And that is, we think, indicative of the fact that the U.S. economy has shown pretty good resilience um, through the first quarter. Uh, we think, as we look at the inflation prints that we've seen, which have been a little bit higher than folks were expecting coming into the first few months of this year, um, that that inflation may actually be indicative of the fact that how, how resilient the U.S. economy is. And so while we do expect inflation or continued disinflation, I should say, and um, sort of a, a con continued decline in above trend growth to more like trend growth, so more like that long-term kind of 2% trend for US, the U.S. economy, um, the markets are, are turning along quite well. And, and this was, we think, the U.S. markets in particular catching up to the fact that because the U.S. economy continues to be so resilient, um, rate cuts would be pushed out more so than we saw in terms of how markets were pricing that likelihood at the beginning of this year. And so this was a little bit of a correction, we think, based on the side of so that's Negative good. numbers, but but yeah. again, we think um, really the market's reaction to what's been a strong economy. And in the month of May, it's gone up a little bit. Did you make up for it? We have that? seen uh, positive um, marks so far on a day-to-day -day basis in May. The stock um, market's up about 3.6% yeah. yep. uh, through Monday, actually through last Probably. night. From, for the month. For the month. Yeah. So almost so it's actually been a good May. Almost back to even and just tell by your spine. <laughs> but we have to caveat this, and we still have 52 days to go before June 30th, which is our fiscal year end. So, but you're not counting. <laughs> no, I am <laughs> counting. I have seen Jeff. Well, and that's the And before you count, before you even count the, the rebound in May, um, the fiscal year to date return for equities is still double digits through April. So, um, a very strong fiscal year period. To this point, um, even without That's, that May rebound, that was through April. That was through April so for equities. Good. Yeah, um, we've seen just as much volatility on the on the on the interest rate side as well. So your fixed income um, has sold off as interest rates have risen. Although spread credit spreads continue to be quite tight. Again, we think a testament to the strength of the economy. Um, so as we continue to to move through the year. Um, you know, we're still expecting, as I said before, growth to, to likely moderate uh, closer to trend. Uh, we we'll continue to see, we would expect to see inflation continue to come down a little bit. Um, and it's possible that, you know, any number of risks in the broader economy, geopolitics could lead to things changing quickly. Um, you could see, for example, a lot more inflation around commodity prices if, if we continue to get more conflicts um, in the world. Uh, especially when you look at what's going on in the Middle East and in Ukraine, um, that could certainly put you know further uh, further stress on economies as commodity prices have risen substantially uh, this year. But beyond that, I think um, you know we'll continue to, to keep a close eye. Or it's been, Steve, we'll go into more detail next month. Great, thank you, Marsha. Any questions for Michael? Thank you. So we'll move on to our star recommendations. Steve. Great, terrific. Thank Actually, you. Um, can you want to join us at the table? Thank you, Kate. Everyone knows Kate. Right, Kate. Why don't you introduce Kate yourself Scott, for the yeah. Our chief of staff. Hey, okay. hello. Good morning, trustees. I'm Kate Viscanti, uh, chief of staff for the Bureau of Asset Management. Welcome, Kate. Star. It's a pleasure. Just going to pass out some material here. Since my time at the, uh, at the Bureau of Asset <laughs> Management, I think this is Kate's first field trip. Which she's actually been let out of the office. <laughs> yeah, you can keep her. I, I realized working that. just staring at it. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I said she must not have been here. <laughs> <laughs> so while well, well, Kate is passing around materials, I will start um, just with a little bit of background and context, just as a sort of uh, to set the table for this conversation, and just as a reminder. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. I have an extra. Uh, so, does somebody need it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
if folks remember about a year and a half ago, um, we brought to this board and the other boards as well, a recommendation to move forward on what we call the strategic and tactical accountability review of BAM operations and how BAM is providing, if and how BAM is providing the support for trustees across the five systems that trustees need and want. Um, and that process then, um, as part of that process, each uh, system appointed a liaison to the STAR Oversight Committee to help guide BAM through that process. Um, there was one labor representative from each of the five systems. I think uh, first Deborah, then Tom uh, represented TRS, as well as Mayor's Office of Pension Investments sat on this oversight committee. Um, that sort of guided us through an RFP process to hire a consultant to, to do this, to do a sort of deep dive into the, the BAM operations and trustee support um, that BAM provides. Um, the, uh, the result of that process was to bring on McKinsey to uh, do a sort of deep dive uh, and assessment. Um, that assessment began sort of the beginning of October and wrapped up the end of February. At the same time, um, there was a, um, the controller's office uh, brought on Mercer to do a comp study, a compensation study for BAM. Um, the last time there had been a compensation study was in 2014, which led to increases for the investment staff. And um, increase, there have no, not been increases for many of the titles since then. And so we wanted to do an updated compensation study. And at the same time, um, we brought on a, a different consultant to do a review of our ETI program, the Economically Targeted Investment Program, because that program has also not really been updated in the past 20 years. We run the same, do the same investments as part of that program. We wanted to assess how do we bring that program into the 21st century. So we didn't want to bring <laughs> haphazard. The ETI uh, review ended first or ended around the same time the McKinsey review started and Mercer uh, ended about a month and a half after the McKinsey review ended. And so rather than coming to the trustees in a haphazard, here's what ETI results, here's STAR, here's Mercer, we decided to just like hold on everything to try to bring one comprehensive set of recommendations to the boards um, to see how, if we can get agreement on how we can update and move forward um, on BAM operations, our ETI program and compensation. So what we're bringing to you today is our recommendations coming out of the results. I think many of you heard directly from McKinsey and Mercer at the beginning of April, um, as well as from BAM on a call with trustees towards the end of April. And now um, we wanna officially present recommendations for discussion and hopefully action uh, at next month's board meeting, but um, we'll see. And maybe just to provide a little bit of historical context as well. In the past uh, event around 2015, there was a, another uh, study done called the Funston Report, which was very much BAM centric and it was very much operational and best practices oriented. This, the intent on the strategic and tactical accountability review is very much focused on how we support and service the trustees, how we can improve our capabilities, how we can expand and be able to do more work on a customized basis, but do it efficiently. Uh, and the results of, of that analysis of what we're going to uh, share with you today. Um, okay, so can we go to the next slide? Okay, well, I did this one. Right? Sorry, can we go to the next slide? <laughs> um, so today what we want to talk through are um, some of the uh, outcomes of this is yeah, it's, some of those slides are a little messy. Well, Fran, can you go to the next one? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. I was like, wait, this is missing right here. Okay. Yeah. So what we want to talk through today is um, we want to give you an update on some of the STAR implementation work that is happening within the controller's office that does not require trustee action that we hope will provide benefit, better trustee service, but doesn't require this, the action of this board. And then we want to walk through what we're calling the trustee service compact which is what we are recommending um, become an annual process at the, at the boards through which the boards and BAM can work together to understand what the BAM work plan is each year, um, through which the boards will have visibility and approval rights over the corpus parts of the BAM budget. Because right now the board doesn't actually, we do it sort of retroactively. 
Um, and then also talk about um, a joint a recommendation for joint manager meetings and go through what we're recommending for the corpus budget in the coming year and uh, new and additional resources coming out of these various groups. Can we go to the next slide? So investment procurement. One of the issues that uh, came out of the McKinsey review that was not surprising is that both BAM staff and uh, trustees are frustrated by the length of time it takes to execute any procurement in the public markets. Um, and so as McKinsey was reviewing that process, what they found was, you know, we follow the uh, procurement policy board rules for public market investments. There, what we found were two things. One, um, that actually the state PPB rules around what uh, governs New York's common and New York state teachers is actually different than the city rules and allows for expedited procurement, more similar to what we do in the private markets. And so one outcome of this is the Office of General Counsel is gonna look into that and say, is there a reason why New York cities have to be different or, or than the states or can we move towards adopting the state? Uh, from a policy board rules, thus expediting the whole process. And that will be, that is something OGC, the, the Controller's Office General Counsel is starting to look into to see what the possibilities are. In the meantime, what they found was that there is a lot of duplication of work within the Controller's Office that delays the process, even if we have to, we stick with the current PPD rules. And they think that if we can get rid of some of that duplicative work, we can probably cut the procurement timeline in half. And so we've gotten agreement from the controller and from the deputy controller um, for administration and the ACWA's office and the controller's office to try to get rid of that duplication and to have a BAM chief uh, contracting officer that is separate and apart from the, that is uh, different than the controller's office agency chief contracting officer, so that we can have two parallel processes. Because one of the problems is we have a huge contracting backlog in BAM, and then we get through it, and then it sits in the contracting backlog in the ACWA's office. And, and so we're trying to um, get rid of that duplication, and so we've gotten agreement and permission to hire a BAM specific ACO and BAM specific legal resources that was resource, both of whom will be 100% dedicated to um, overseeing the procurement team within BAM and uh, expediting our procurement. So that is exciting. And like, to me, it feels like a very big bureaucratic win. Um, so. Um, but it also, it rolls up to the chief investment officer. Right. So there's more accountability. So for example, we have a dedicated team uh, that works within the, uh, the, the general counsel's office within the controllers group that only focuses on private uh, uh, asset deals for the five pension plans are 100% dedicated to that. I sit down in about every other week with Irina Tomova, who actually runs that group for us, to go through all the contracts and where they're sticking points. And then we, as a team, or I will reach out to our counterparties and say, can you work with your legal folks? We're not making progress. We're kind of bogged down in this issue. We do that to great effect. And the reason we, we have a different process is because private assets are not considered to be something that needs to go through the normal procurement process. So we've got great efficiency there. Having the ACO and the public market side roll up into the CIO gives us the same visibility, the same accountability, and the same responsibility for pushing things through. So for example, when you give us a mandate, it shouldn't take two years for us to execute and implement. I know we have an issue right now we're delaying intentionally and we owe you an answer on the fellow market XUS. That's kind of separate and apart, but this gives us an opportunity because there's more visibility uh, and more accountability to get on the phone and call BlackRock or, or whoever the, the counterparty is that we're contracting with to move things forward. Um, so again, we, we're hoping we can cut it down by at least half. Um, okay, and then just moving forward to the next slide. So then consultants, one of the things, and, and Steve, I don't know if you wanna jump in here, but one of the issues that came up is that the way that the consultant dynamics across each of the systems is very and there are different expectations of consultants across the systems, um, and um, it's just not consistent. And so, you know, TRS obviously does the um, procurement for the TRS general consultant. I, think, I believe BAM, on behalf of the system, does the procurement for the specialty consultants. 
Um, and we do the procurement for especially consultants and general consultants for most, though not all, of the other systems. And so we just want to uh, work with the trustees to regular, like to systemize expectations, reporting, et cetera, really follow the lead of what Rubicon already does, um, and have the specialty consultants sort of report up into the general consultants in a more concrete way. I think um, the benefit there is, you know, obviously, I think the relationship that the Bureau of Asset Management has with the various consultants is actually really good. It's, it's quite good here. Uh, it's actually improved. I think it's in pretty good state uh, across the five plans. Um, the benefit of, of, of having the specialty consultants uh, work more closely with the general consultants is you want the general consultants just as BAM has, you want the, someone to think and be looking at your portfolios more holistically. And I think it's, you know, with, with Mike and, and team in Rokatan, you have responsibility for strategic asset allocation. Well, 20, 30% of that, 25, 30% of that now is, is in uh, alternative assets. So we, I believe you need to have that there needs to be more accountability on the part of the specialty consultants into the general consultants. This is really nothing with, to do with the Bureau of Asset Management. It's just to try to get more brains in the game and thinking more holistically about what we do and how we do it. And this isn't something that we're asking anybody to vote on now yeah. or engage on now. This is for awareness that in the coming year, as um, for the, the specialty consultant contracts are going to be expiring in 2025, as are other general consultant contracts. So we're coming back to you with changes in language, the RFP, et cetera, for, and you all have to approve all RFP language um, to try to, up, to make some updates to, to maximize the consultant. Okay. So those are the quick updates. Um, and now to the trustee service compact. Um, we can go to the next slide. So basically one of the, um, the sort of tropes that kept coming up throughout the STAR process was a concern by trustees that, um, you know, the dynamic between BAM and the systems and trustees like changes with every controller. Right, because personalities are involved, priorities are changed, et cetera. And if we're going to agree to changes now, how do we know that things that we're um, setting up now will outlast controller Brad Lander's tenure? And one thing that we, so one thing that we sort of like wrestled with was how to do that. And we realized that in any other service provider relationship, there's a contract, there's an agreement or an MOU in what is gonna, what services uh, somebody is going to um, provide on behalf of their client. And we wanna create that between BAM and the trustees because BAM is a service provider for the five systems. And so what we're recommending is that every June, BAM, uh, it's June, right? <laughs> um, every June, moving into the next fiscal year, Kate is really the mastermind behind everything. So um, every June, moving to the next fiscal year, BAM would present to trustees a draft work plan for the net following year that lays out what the priorities are, what the work we're going to be doing in across every aspect of the work that BAM does. <coughs> um, get trustee input in that. If there are things that, you know what, we really want you to focus on this, not that. Have that conversation, wrestle with it. And have it be something the board votes on as like, this is the compact. This is what you guys are going to be doing over the course of next year. Within that, we would also include if there are any resource changes or add what we would include, what the budget is, what the staffing is, et cetera. Because right now, again, there is no transparency actually around BAM budget. You get an invoice after money has been spent. Um, and this would provide an avenue to create that transparency. So what you have before you, this is in Convene, it was circulated the other day, and it's also in paper, um, so what Kate handed out, is a draft of the FY25 um, service compact. In this document, and we'll go into the details in a moment, um, we are including language that would um, ban mission statements, service aspiration statement, and service commitments in broad strokes the BAM work plan, as well as a, a draft calendar for investment meeting content, which we'll get into uh, in a bit. A proposal for a four-month pilot of a joint manager meeting that, again, I'll get into in more detail. What we would recommend is that this become related to the actual delegation, because that's the way to actually hold us accountable, right? You have a legal delegation, and so... Uh, 
with that. And then lastly, the corp annual corpus budget. And in this year's instance, um, the results of the comp study and our recommendations for additional resources coming out of start. So I'm going to go through uh, top lines of these, uh, the bolded points now, because we need to discuss them. The rest is really in this. And like our hope is that we sent it around, I think yesterday or the day before, we expect no action today, obviously. Our hope is that you all take this, read it, we can have discussion, et cetera, and then we can come back ideally next month um, and hopefully be ready to act. Next slide. Um, so a central component of the um, uh, the work that coming out of STAR, and we actually are in a much stronger place of TRS because we just updated the IPS statement mm -hmm. than uh, many of the other systems, is to make sure that there are agreed upon codified investment beliefs that everybody shares. I would say one of the things that came out of the STAR review I mean, everybody on this one board yes, shares, yes. not across the system. Yes, that everybody on the one system and this one board shares. Thank you. Coming out of the STAR study, one of, there was a survey done of trustees and BAM staff, and 75% of BAM staff said that um, they like are confident they understand the priorities and will of the trustees, and 25% of trustees said that they were confident that the BAM staff understood the priority and will of the trustees. So that's a problem. And um, each of the, while probably 90% of the priorities and beliefs are consistent across the five systems, that 10% that aren't are important and we have to be able to understand how to customize. Um, and so um, we are, as part of this year's service, the work plan for 2025, Fiscal year 2025 is to actually like make sure we understand the differences really between the five systems investment beliefs and that we are on the same page with the trustees around what we said. Um, you can go to the next slide. Allison, oh, yeah. before you move on, mm -hmm. just, just a quick question. I know when, uh, I think in the previous administration, we had had, we had put together an investment belief statement here at TRS. Yes. So are you saying that we would just be going through that and updating that from yes. year to year? Okay. Yes. And I just not even updating necessarily, just like doing a quick right. check. Yeah, being like, we're still sure. here, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and also included in McKinsey's recommendation, so is uh, asset class specific investment beliefs. So you have fund level investment beliefs that, that articulate your priorities for, for example, internal or external or passive management. Um, those could be reviewed yearly and updated, but then also they recommend that we make asset class specific investment beliefs. Um. So that piece would be new. And it will lead to more customization. We want to make sure that you know what, what, what's important to the trustees of the various five boards that we're able to accommodate and understand, and then work towards uh, fulfilling those needs. So it's more about you know getting on the same page, and then uh, accountability on our part in terms of you know executing and implementing to those those uh, uh, beliefs and, and preferences. Great, thanks. Um. Okay, um, joint manager meeting proposals. So one of the other uh, components that came out of STAR is that we as trustees are not necessarily spending our board time as effectively as we could be. So I think we've all been through the trainings that say that and know that, you know, people say 90% of our returns come from our asset allocation and portfolio construction and 10% from manager selection. We currently spend as a board 80 something percent of our time on manager selection and like 10 to 15 percent of our time on those kinds of strategic questions and that doesn't really make any sense so what we are recommending is that we establish one monthly joint manager meeting across all five systems whereby we invite managers who are going to be um who are you know, up for review, manager recommendations that are up for review, to present to everyone. You know, it is not a voting meeting. No action will be taken at that meeting. Um, all of the BAM and consultant memos, you will get receive all the BAM and consultant, mem consultant memos prior to that meeting, so you can ask the managers questions, et cetera. Listen, leave, and then when we come to our regular investment meeting, regularly scheduled investment meeting, that's where we do 
anything we need to do on portfolio construction, asset allocation. I know Steve wants to yep. talk through fees, like a whole bunch of strategic, pure analysis, pure analysis st strategic questions that we need to answer as a board. And at those regular investment meetings, we will take action on the manager recommendations that we heard from at the joint manager meeting. Sounds like a sin to me. Right? It's not a sin. It's what? different than a sin because there's no because there's no voting or caucusing at the joint manager meeting. It's just an opportunity to meet the managers in person and hear from them. How many of the trustees? All, it would be all five systems would be in the room to hear from the managers um, and to ask questions. In the room and via Zoom. And via Zoom. In the room or via Zoom. It would be hybrid. Question. Yeah. Do you have a plan on how to get everyone to meet once a month? I think what we would do is we would identify a day that every month that would be consistent every cover in advance. Tony? Yeah, uh, just in terms of as, as you guys are really listening to the trustees and wanting to customize for the funds, would so let's say a manager that bur that burrs and fires are interested in, would they come to the joint manager if, they, if they're not necessarily going to be in the framework of TRS? We would, would that probably, be independent or just what we would in? probably do is the same thing we would do with hedge funds, right? Because not because yeah. TRS doesn't invest in hedge funds, is we'd like schedule it so that if there's a manager that only is only coming before a few of the systems, we do it last so that everybody else can leave and those who need to stay can stay. Um, so there would be no action. So it would be like, you know, an hour or two a month where everybody's hearing from the managers, and then we come to our regular meetings, our regular investment meetings on Thursday for TRS on the first Thursday, or in this case, the second Thursday, but the first Thursday of the month at 10 a.m. and do the business of TRS. I'm trying to figure out how, how that would help us. I mean, uh, so the managers wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have the interaction with the managers, manage, managers in, a, in this intimate session. Correct. It would be a less intimate interaction. I think you could still pull a manager that aside and, and talk to them. I think it benefited us because it would provide us with the opportunity to spend these days talking about. And Steve, why don't you talk a little yeah, bit about Yeah, so there's this. a number of other things that, that I, I believe as trustees, we need to provide you with information on peer analysis. Is how did your portfolio compare to, say, similar types of funds of your same size uh, in the public pension space? Fees value for fees, um, alpha generated on a fee basis. There's so many things that we need to present that, that, we, that we are actually building the technology for and building the reporting for. It's just a matter of how do you want to use your time efficiently? I understand that, but at the expense of not having that intimate relationship, back and forth questioning managers, I feel lots of managers and many of the funds, a lot of trustees speak all the time. And they, they speak. <laughs> and they speak. <laughs> and they like to speak. <laughs> Maybe because they are told to speak for whatever reason. I just feel that. I, and I understand how much time, I, I remember we had three re-up managers come up and it took 25 minutes. So how much time would we be saving at the investment meeting for you to do all that other stuff? So I think it's two parts. It's time that we're saving the investment meeting, then it's time that we're saving, to be honest, amongst BAM investment staff and the managers. Because what happens now is like, and Steve told this story uh, the other day to somebody, yeah. We'll have a manager because of the way the meetings are, the five separate meetings are set up, who's hold stays in a hotel in New York for 10 days in order to be here to present to each manager in person, each team in person. And that's time that they're not doing what we need them to be doing. Exactly. Um, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. We, we did have uh, actually one of your managers come in who was actually a manager for the other four plants as well. And again, based on the cadence of the meetings, had to be here for a full week in a hotel working and then go home for, to Atlanta for the weekend and come back on for a Tuesday, Wednesday. So, yeah, for, so just for the record, um, no, not one single manager has ever complained about having to come spend time with any of the five plans. That's not the issue. We're just, what we do recognize though is there's an increased um, allocation to alternative assets 
there may be more and more deals that we need to go through the process reviewing. And if there's more customization, we may have just a higher number of deals that may not apply to all the plans. We're trying to figure out a way, how can we do this efficiently? Um, using technology, maybe we would use for re-ups, we would use Zoom technology. For new managers, they'd physically be in the room and people can actually come and, and, and look them in the eye and ask questions. Um, I, I understand that the, the concerns Tom, Tom raised, and I, I am sympathetic. We're really just trying to figure out how can we be more efficient in terms of, of striking that balance between you know, enabling and supporting the trustees need to do that due diligence and look people in the eye, make smart decisions on how you're allocating your money, uh, but also recognize that there is a number of other things that we should be thinking about and looking at. Um, it, you know, this, the, there are some efficiencies for, for BAM in terms of the joint manager meeting. That shouldn't really drive what we're doing here. It should be how, is there a better way that we can support and service? And we're open-minded. That's, I, I think Allison was specific when she said, we're asking for a four month pilot. Let's see if it works with an open mind. And if it doesn't work. Um, I understand where you're coming from. Well, so it's a type of efficiency, but you have to understand where we're coming from. If I'm about to approve or, or give to a, a manager $329 million of TRS's money, there's nothing like that intimate relationship with the manager for all that yeah. money. They will have to figure out going back and forth to Atlanta and staying in hotel rooms. But, uh, and you, you did say they didn't have a problem. Not at all. They're ha they, and they're to, see, I told the CEO and he said, we're happy to do it. How much time would we actually save well, we could do those other things? And how long would that investment meeting be if we took yeah. away all the managers? It would be a short investment meeting, yeah. wouldn't it? It'd be a shorter investment meeting, like this type of meeting, Tom. But there'd still be discussions and presentations. You still have to vote in your own uh, way, and in your you, you still would need to present. So you go to that meeting, exactly. Yep. And then you come back here and you discuss it, exactly. And we're a here week later, two weeks later, whatever the schedule is, yeah. you know, yeah. if we do. And there's nothing like discussing it in, in the sim. We went from the group to the caucus. No, there's nothing like we don't. There's Where that is not. I mean, if you wanted to do that, that, that's fine. I think the other difference between this and what and this what we're recommending here in the sim is that my understanding, having not sat in the sim, was that the sim we the there was no there was little to no opportunity to d discuss customized individual um, system specific strategy issues and how TRS differs in needs and fee for fees or portfolio construction, yeah. et cetera, than um, fire, right? And so we don't, we, we don't want to go back to that consolidated um, vehicle because each system is different with different needs, et cetera. We but have we want to create needs here at Teachers Retirement. Exactly. And, and it is intimidating perhaps or I'd be less likely to ask questions. I know everyone is talking. Uh, I just want to know how this how this helps us as a board taking away that relationship with the manager. Yes, I can ask my questions there too if I got a chance to, you know, my hand up. Yeah, I just yeah, I mean, look, I we're not asking for action right now. What okay. I, I would, I guess I would ask, having not been at the SIM, because the one the one thing that is similar to the SIM is that the managers came in front of all five systems at the same time during that period of time. And I guess the question I would ask is, did you feel like you were able to have relationships and ask the questions that you needed to ask with the managers in that, in that room or not? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, and again, what we're asking for is a pilot. That would then have to that would have to be renewed after the pilot. How long would the pilot? Um, our proposal is it would be from September through December, so a four month. Starting pilot. this year. Starting this year. Yeah. yeah. September of this year through December, so and a four month pilot that would have to then be voted on to continue. And would re-up managers be present at this? Uh, joint so the original meeting? proposal that we had uh, floated and we started floating, um, spoke to one of the boards, was that. New man only new managers would de facto be, but I think we heard you off. I know we had a conversation a few days ago. Yes, we could. We would include every manager coming before the board. Three up, new, what happened? Day two. So just to build on what Tom was uh, saying, I think there's a couple of concerns regarding 
that model. And I understand the kind of simplicity of it, right? We're having an ease of it to have the managers come in once, do their spiel once, and and have everybody be there. I think the concerns that that Tom and I had with the sim, as opposed, and we were both on this board prior to and now post, is the one thing that I felt, and I think some of the other trustees felt, was that when a when a manager steps into this room and looks at the teachers trustees right the set, six or seven of us that are here on the board they understand that we are the we are the board that they are pitching this deal to us what it felt like at the sim was more that they were there for ban right and that we just happen to be 40, 50 people in the room, but really that the goal was that the manager was there to kind of keep BAM happy and that we were secondary considerations, even though they told, you know, even though they go up and they tell us how much they love public workers and how their <laughs> sister was a teacher and blah, 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 right? So all of that, I think it really did feel to us like we weren't, the main audience in that room, the way we're the main audience in this room. And I think the other, the other thing that Tom was mentioning that, that I agree with is that uh -huh. there is a dynamic here or a comfort level here on this board to ask questions or to bring things up that in a room with five boards, either may not get brought up because it's more internal stuff that, you know, or an issue that we have that maybe another board doesn't, or, you know, six people would ask questions already. And now this, this particular manager is getting growth for 45 minutes and everybody kind of want to keep moving on. And this other board wants to ask another question. And so there's these moments in, in that system, in that setup where, maybe the, the feeling was is that we weren't gonna be feeling comfortable asking particular questions or additional questions or adding, asking for more depth that we would feel more comfortable digging into here at this point. So, you know, I, I just want those two issues to kind of be present in your minds as we move forward with whatever the decisions are. Sure. And would the meeting be for just trustees or, or staff as well would be coming? us to these joint management meetings. I, I would defer to trustees and we can assess. That might be a hard to for staff. And, and there is a Zoom option. Yes. Yeah, it would be I, hybrid. It would be hybrid. So look again, we're not asking anyone to take any action today. Just so these see. are all worthy obviously concerns. And I want to be clear if any of the five we're presenting this and if any of the systems say absolutely no like this won't work right this doesn't work if like four systems say we're in and one is like no you have to come to my own board because then everybody it doesn't make any sense so you know we should we should continue the discussion yeah. and i encourage you to talk to your colleagues in labor across the systems to see if there is uh um something everyone can agree on or think about, and then we can, we'll move on from there. And we'll assess. We, I, we, and I certainly, I, I, I hear the, uh, the, the feedback. I understand the feedback. I'm very sympathetic of the position. And our objective here isn't to drive a wedge between any of the trustees and their managers. Um, and if this didn't work, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board and figure out how we can do the things more efficiently in another way. But the idea isn't to, to disenfranchise the trustees or the boards from their asset managers. Um, it's trying to incorporate a, a bit of a bit more of efficiency because we, we expect to see more and more deals and with customization, a lot larger number of managers. Um, but I recognize fully who, who I work for and who we support and service. And if it doesn't work, we're happy to Keep things as they are. We'll, we'll figure out another way to. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Position to the staff with the consultants be there present as well. Yes. Can we go from the back? Yes, sure. Yeah. And kids will. Oh. And um. <laughs> That's important. Yeah. As long as it's in the school nurse. Um. And and maybe one other thing to consider if this goes forward, or at least to consider in in the 
the pilot of it is to at least to make sure that the manager is available for this smaller meeting as well so that once the presentation happens between that and the board actually voting that if the trustees have a concern or something has popped up or something we can have them back to answer those questions they don't have to be in person they can they can yeah. do that remotely if need be but just to have them available and the consultants available at this second meeting where the voting is happening to get any issues cleared up if we were preparing to have you know abbreviated summary uh memos as well to actually talk to the trustees about in at their own meetings but those are all valid points we're again it's um Listen, this is a recommendation that, you know, working with a consultant that I think has merit. Not all of them have to be accepted. Um, this is the one that I think is most challenging to be candid. As a former trustee, I, I understand your your concerns, uh, and I'm completely sympathetic. Uh, you're a hundred plus billion dollar fund. You've got hundreds of thousands of, dollars, uh, hundreds of, thousands of participants uh, and beneficiaries. Um, you have a job to do, and if you think the best way to do your job is having everyone come here physically, we'll do that. If you think there's a hybrid physical via Zoom or if the joint manager meeting makes sense, uh, we're not here. The idea isn't to re-engineer your work. It's how can we better support and service um, and be better business partners. It's, it, so I hear the feedback. That's yeah. Feedback. Wouldn't we have enough to talk about at those? Investment meetings enough about asset allocation. There's there's a lot of construction that's a, and that's a great point, Tom, because there's a lot more work. We I I, I don't think we do um, I don't think we service the, the various plans and the trustees to the extent we should. There are things as trustees you need to know about. Who are your top top fifty where do you how do you pay your fees? What are your fees by asset class? What are your top fifty uh, firms you pay fees to? How much value, how much alpha are you generating for that? how are we constructing the portfolios and really kind of dig into the small pieces? How do you stack up against your peers? There are other things just thematically, I'm looking at, at Mike and Amanda that, you know, just in terms of this forum to actually go through and present with the general consultants or the specialty consultants, what's going on? What are the dynamics in these different asset classes? What are the other things you should be thinking about? I think we used to have after uh, in each investment meeting an educational topic of yeah. discussion after meeting the managers and yeah. going over the, the charts that you have one specific topic and you know, education of the trade, trustee education. Yeah. Which we, we try to do that through this thought leadership speaker okay. series, but that's exactly right. We would do that here as well in different forms of customized to um, TRS, for example. By the way, I, I should just say I'm not disappointed by any of the feedback, I have a complete. Oh, we'll try harder. To, <laughs> <laughs> you know how we could do a better job. Yeah. It helps my comment. Yeah. Every of those words. Yeah. Help us. Thank you. Okay. Should we? Can we move on? I'm sorry, <laughs> I had to run out. The younger child fell down. Hunger strikes. No, no, no hunger strikes today, but. <laughs> The younger, the younger child uh, fell down the stairs. He's fine. He just needs to speak to mommy. So, uh, okay. Next slide. Okay, we can keep going. This is all joint manager meeting process. Okay, Corpus, here we go. Kate, I'm going to hand this over to you to lead us through this part of the presentation. Okay, sure. So, Trustees, um, before we get into what the proposal is today, just a level setting on the current state. So right now there are 133 folks who are currently budgeted for um, BAM. That includes both people who are currently in position and also folks in the pipeline that we have vacancies really. Um, 70 headcount slots of those 133 are currently on the corpus line. So they're built to the five systems. That's not teacher specific. Um, that's total across the five systems. And similarly, the budget that we currently have uh, in BAM is around 11 million. And that's both corpus and uh, city funding. We can go to the next slide, we'll now. Uh, so based on the recommendations, as Allison said at the beginning from both McKinsey, who did a pretty rigorous analysis of our resourcing. Um, so basically our headcount numbers, 
And then also um, based on the compensation analysis that Mercer did, we put together a proposal. Um, so that proposal would increase the headcount based on star recommendations to 127. I should say that's corpus specifically. Um, for city plus corpus, we would be looking at uh, 163. So it's an overall 30 person increase in headcount. Um, so there are a few things that are considered in that. Um, the first one is the fact that the AUM is gone. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Okay. No, that was just a hand gesture. Just a hand. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's uh, reflecting an increase in AUM. So, for example, when McKinsey did their analysis, they sort of did a regression that said, okay, how if you look at peers, how are peers resourced? Peers, they, they adjusted for things like internal or external management and all of that and said, okay, given your AUM, what would be the size that we would expect um, your staff to be? Um, and that includes the fact that with the new asset allocation, there's an increase in uh, AUM. <clears throat> in the private market specifically where there's more due, more uh, frequent due diligence done. So that's one component and, uh, uh, or two really with the new asset allocation. Um, and then also writing ourselves a little bit to be uh, able to be a little bit more customized for the, the system. Um, so uh, basically the proposal overall we're, we're putting together here would raise the corpus funding to approximately one basis point. So. 0.1%, 0.01% of AUM of the five combined systems. So we would pr presumably be requesting from each system a pro rata allocation of that based on a few, uh, basically pro rata, but with a few considerations, for example, you would never pay for hedge funds. Uh, or if you, you go forward with other types of customization, you would or wouldn't pay for it. Okay, raise yeah. corpus budget 0.1%. Zero one. Not you would, zero. Be, it would be raised one. to be 0 0.01%. One percent. One base. Zero. Yeah, 1%. And one that is, is we're not one. asking to raise it by 0.01% or two. Two zero two. One percent. What would the difference be? It's about you know? the, in so percentage, I, I don't exactly off the top of my head. In the dollar amount? We're getting um, there. We'll get, oh. there. we'll get there on the next slide. Yeah. So it's Okay. So it is low. It's maybe I actually do know. It's it's right around point zero zero five or point zero zero six right now. Yeah. So it is growing. Go to the next next slide. Okay, this one's a little a little, a little funny. We have to scroll a little bit. Um, but this is just a graphic representation of what we just said. Um, so. Again, the if you allocate pro rata for teachers, that would be about ten point five. Again, that doesn't million. That doesn't include, of course, hedge funds or anything. Um, total corpus budget. Um, yeah. uh, so the total band budget would be um, closer to thirty five million. So that includes some from city as well. You can go to the next slide. No, I can't run through uh, this in terms of well, this is McKinsey's recommendation in order for us to, to be able to do better things uh, and more customization uh, and actually just benchmarking us against our peers in terms of staffing. Um, that's what the represent, representation is in the middle portion. So we would be looking and asking to add an additional 14 uh, people to the investment team, which is the bulk of the increases. Uh, and then some to ETIs, as Allison mentioned, we're trying to reimagine how we can be more impactful in, uh, in, in uh, the ETI space, economically targeted investment space. Risk management, we would add two people. And again, that's to work on a lot of special projects in terms of better analytics uh, and more insight into your portfolio. How do we construct portfolios? We're doing a lot, a lot of things in that front. Um, similarly, financial reporting, I, as I've mentioned in the past, Dan Haas has taken on a bigger role Kind of a hybrid role reporting to operations of chief operating officer Lynn Fleischman, as well as continue to report to Ed Berman as chief risk officer. So there it's to develop better analytics that we can provide more insight into portfolio. And then lastly, just a, an additional resource for DE and I and emerging manager strategies at the bottom. Okay, do you want to talk a little bit about the shift to corpus? Allison. Uh, Allison. Okay. So one of the things that we did as we were looking through this is we tried to rationalize 
um, how the corpus dollars were city dollars were being spent. And this is the org chart that we all, we passed around. Um, what we're recommending, like what's a gray on here is city and what is blue is corpus. Um, one of the things we found was that there was actually not a lot of rhyme or reason to why some people were being paid for by city tax dollars as opposed to corpus. And talking to um, David Jetter and others, there was a lot of it was because of sort of historical practice and a, and we um, are trying to use this process to just rationalize and make sure the folks who are actually doing 100% of their work on behalf of pension funds are paid for by corpus as they should be. And so in doing that, we are shifting um, some folks who are currently be pay being paid for by the city over to uh, corpus expense as part of this. So can I just get some clarification on the expansion of the investment? Mm -hmm. um, so since the, at least from, from my vantage point, a lot of the funds that are coming to us are re-ups. Um, what, what is the idea that, what would this investment, these additional 14 people be doing that the current staff can't handle? Yeah, well, we, see, we think with more customization, there'll be a broader range and different sizes of, of uh, mandates we're bringing in. Also, it's important to remember, even though it's a re-up, we still go through the exact same due diligence process. We re-underwrite every new deal. It goes through our green light process for approval. And once that's approved, it goes uh, for further analysis of due diligence and an informal vote at the investment committee a couple of months or so later. Um, we uh, obviously we think that's an, an, an appropriate and important part of our discipline. So we'd be looking at other deals, other opportunities to do different things. Uh, and we are constantly in the marketplace looking for um, new opportunities for the, for, the, for the plans, particularly with the growth in assets overall uh, and with the growth in or the higher allocations to alternative investments. Great, thanks. Steve. I also need clarification. You said that uh, this recommendation is coming from the uh, recommendation from McKinsey, the benchmarking against uh, against other our peers. Peer analysis. So is it the peers with the same uh, type of retirement? Is it a public retirement system? Mm -hmm. the yes, same yes. Number of people? Yep. Are our peers, I can just think of a couple of uh, CalPERS, CalSTRS, a couple of common. teachers in yeah, common. common. So you're talking about peers, the same Yes. So, what Kate, do you want to walk through the process that McKinsey went through? On yeah, this sure. And so we, have, we can circulate again the McKinsey slides. Yeah, so on this point, McKinsey's analysis was pretty sophisticated, actually. So, they looked at a few different factors that determine uh, how, how large a team could be. So, for example, um, whether you're managing more money internally or externally, how much you have in AUM and all of uh, other some other considerations like that. And then they ran a regression to say, okay, if you basically, what is it worth <laughs> to have to run this much AUM? And then they sort of built it back up. So they took all of our peers and kind of got them down mathematically to um, something that they could then scale up again. We can uh, research it. Yeah. What's the primary benchmark? primary peers we compare this? So this is something McKinsey did. We have a list I think that we can share with you in the, or you, may, you may actually even already have it in the McKinsey uh, proposal, but it is uh, originally, like Tom said, a, a set of public pension peers, but then you can't just go apple to apple. Some pensions are bigger or smaller. And so that's why they did those sort of transformation. But, and also some, some pension funds do more in-house management of investments than we have. and. Most pension funds have less complexity because there is probably one board as opposed to five, right? And so, and less customization. So they they did a full analysis from a top down. Yeah. Is there any analysis show there is a report that would tell us how this is going to affect our retirees? We have to get something for it. I'm just thinking. 10.5 million per year average pension. I mean, how many pensions do we pay with this money going forward with accrued interest on this money? Thousands and thousands of 
literally thousands yeah. of our pensioners, their pensions for the rest yeah. of their lives. So is there anything written or report on how it's going to benefit our our pensioners? We could put something together, Tom. It's going to be obviously assumption based, but those, you're asking the absolute right question because I, I actually been believe put together yet. Well, we've, we've worked on it a number of different, there's a whole bunch of different projects we're working on where we have expected increases in terms of returns. But we believe with the right people and the right strategy over the three to five years, we're talking, you know, at least a half a percent increase in your performance. Which will benefit. That's, that's it pays, we think the incremental cost pays for itself a hundred times. And frankly, these are, you know, that's good to hear. We're, we'll be better resourced and better able to, to execute on this with the right people, with a diverse group of talent. People matter. We really want to be able to retain and attract uh, the right people to make a difference here. But there, you're absolutely right, Tom. There's got to be a lot. How are you leveraging that additional? And what's the money? value add? That's we, it. Yeah, exactly. That's what's it. the value that's proposition? The line. We're willing to do this. How is this going to affect the fungibility of our pension system and, and, and our retirees that we have yeah. to face every single day? Yeah. Yeah, and Tom also it helps us be a little more nimble. We're working on a whole bunch of different projects right now. It's it's an overwhelming amount of work on uh, the current team. You know, we're not fully staffed right now uh, in order to get these things done. Yeah. So in terms of, I mean, this is a question that I've had for a while. We, it seems that a lot of time is spent on doing the management due diligence, which is super important. But we also have, but the, I, I have two manager reports, one from them and one from the consultants that kind of were very, very, very similar. It seems like we're always kind of duplicative in that, and that takes up a lot of time. Right? Is, is there some way that just within this overall context, maybe instead of a full throttle report, we have them to go over the consultant review of the manager. We don't have to duplicate that work. That will cut out a significant amount of time and open up a lot of different opportunities for customization. That's a fair, you know, honestly, that's a fair question, right? It, it does seem like a duplication. And sometimes, Tony, honestly, sometimes a triplication of work, right? Because there's more than one uh, specialty consultant. I do think a, a couple things. Firstly, you want to make sure that you're doing your independent analysis. We're your advisor. We, we, are, we don't have any other um, motivations. We don't have any other businesses associated with, with these firms other than recommending them for your portfolio. There's no other revenue stream such as an, an OCIO business that one of the consultants may have. I don't mean to be disrespectful of consultant, but just one of the things we work around. Um, you know, I, I think also if you go down that path, you're gonna have a portfolio that's gonna look like everybody else's. There'll be no differentiation because whatever the, the consultants recommend, you're just gonna take. And I do think that you want to have something more unique. And by having more people that can look at different deals, differentiated deals, we think we'll get better diversification. We'll get better performance and alpha for the portfolios over time. That's that's what this is really about. Is you know we're staffing that not so it's easier for us to do our work, but it's we're more effective in terms of driving those returns in the portfolio. Every everything we do should be focused on that one critical goal, right? Is, is returns. Uh, move forward. So in addition to the additional headcount, as I mentioned, as part of this process, we um, had Mercer, Mercer did a compensation study. And so, um, Kate, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so you, you all, I believe, have seen the compensation study that they did. Um, so you'll remember they basically gave us 75th and 50th percentage percentiles for a few different sectors, um, government, financial services, endowments and foundations, but most relevant uh, public pensions. So we've based the recommendations on what they gave us from the public pension uh, world. Um, Mercer's feeling was that given our AUM and our structure and the fact that we don't have an incentive program, we should probably be targeting somewhere in the 75th percentile uh, of their recommendation. If you go to the next slide, feel free to. Um, but basically we wanted to be thoughtful and not just go with exactly what they say. So we uh, thought of some principles that would guide how we basically made our recommendation. The first one is, uh, and Steve can speak to this more, but just the idea that we want to seek competitive compensation and in order to be able to attract and retain talent, we have had some turnover at BAM and yeah. uh, we've had some trouble hiring. Um, 
The next one is the flattened distribution. If you look at the numbers from Mercer purely, the CIO is compensated you know, tenfold higher than the lowest paid employee. Um, so we did some work to basically flatten that distribution. So there's uh, some sort of bringing down of the top salary. I'm really um, trying to force the salary increases at the level that are most impactful, not to discount the CIO, whoever he or she is, uh, but <laughs> focusing more on the asset class hits and the senior investment officers. Uh, and again, it also then gives the other folks in the team um, motivation to, to, to work and move up over time, which we're, we're very receptive of that as well. And then the third thing is just uh, the reality of the context. We're very cognizant that we're investing in public pensions and, and that these are very high salaries for the public sector. Um, so just that, that is in mind as we put forward the recommendations. Um, so on average, what we ended up with is 3% lower than Mercer's 50th percentile. Um, we didn't say, okay, let's target 3% lower. We came up with salaries that made sense in relationship to each other. Um, and that's kind of where it ended up. Did yeah. Mercer do that? So Mercer gave us the numbers at the 50th percentile, the 75th percentile, and we looked at those and said what feels reasonable given these principles, okay. and that's where we, we landed. We discussed them internally for, for, for quite some time in terms of what we thought was reasonable. Again, given the public sector context, given the... You know, the other thing I'll say before we get to the compensation slide is, you know, I, I am a firm believer it's not all about money. There are a lot of other reasons why people work. There's a lot of other reasons why people work in the public sector. And the things that we, the other things that we've done kind of behind the scenes in terms of giving people voice, giving them a career path, training, promoting from within, recognizing talent. Uh, we, we think those are, are also primary reasons why people want to work at the Bureau of Asset Management. The asset pool, the fact that we have, you know, collectively, uh, obviously, it's the largest pool, portion of the pool, but with $270 billion in assets, we're, we're relevant. You get to look at a lot of different things. Um, and, I, you know, I think those are really important reasons why people come to and stay at the Bureau of Asset Management. I also in addition to a defined entity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I also have to say, I, um, I, I recognize that, you um, you know, people will have different motivations. We may not be able to keep everybody forever, but if they come and they work hard and they make a difference and they, they can progress a career outside, I mean, I don't have a problem with that philosophically. I think that you know, that level of turnover, you know, bringing fresh blood in and new ideas, I think is healthy. We, we should also mention, Kate, I don't know if you touched on it, but Mercer's recommendation was for us for a number of reasons, given our size, complexity, uh, location in New York, et cetera, to, to target the 75th percentile, which again, we, we, we thought was um, collectively, we thought, and I thought was too high. Go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so this is just very quickly on um, the mapping we did. So if you look at the compensation study, you'll see 25 roles in there. We have more than 25 people on staff. So the idea was basically that we would come up with 25 standard roles and then everyone else within the organization would be matched to those roles. Kind of two reasons for that. One being just the reality of the procurement, which still took two years, even though we kept it small for a reason, um, which speaks to why we need to make those procurement adjustments that we spoke about earlier. Um, but also just a, a sort of to keep the rules standard and more equitable across the bureau. Uh, so that's all I have on this slide. If you want to go to the next one, do you want to take this one? Yeah, this is a slide with a little more more detail. So um, the proposed salary increases, the new salary levels, rather, uh, are in the middle in in, the, in that light green, that, that mid green uh, portion. The analysis to the right of that actually shows where we compare to to Mercer's seventy fifth percentile on the far right and uh, the 50th percentile. So for example, let's pick on the CIO role. The compensation that's been proposed is 29% below the 50th percentile median that Mercer's come up with and fully 50% below the, uh, the, the 75th percentile recommendation. Can, can you also comment on the, um, what does this benchmark us to? What did Mercer actually the firms they looked at? This isn't yeah, looking at say, sure. Goldman Sachs asset management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are kind peers. of four sectors that they looked at broadly. That's endowments, financial services, um, public pensions, most importantly, and I'm forgetting the other one. But basically what we did was we said, okay, we'll take the public pension recommendation 
for all of them, except there yes. were one or two exceptions. And then in those cases where they didn't have a public pension comparison for whatever reason, in those very limited cases, we took the lowest of the other one and made the other ones and made the adjust, uh, yes. recommendation based on that. Yep. But by and large, they're all based on specifically the public pension. Okay, the individuals on the team that aren't yeah. represented here are that. Yeah, yeah, I, I switched that a little bit. But so again, you'll see 25 roles here and we have more staff than that. Um, so those folks are wrapped, are all matched to one of these roles. And there's some folks on here with asterisks. That's just to say that those folks are, can, are currently and will continue to be paid by the city. It's just on here for awareness, basically. It was done as part of the study. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, some of these, how many of these types of civil service titles and what would be the impact on, on the civil That's service? Great question. Excellent question. So we are navigating that right now. Um, mostly the civil service titles are at the bottom of the range. Um, and some of them are currently the recommended comp is at currently above the allowed civil service range. And we are beginning conversations with our HR and admin folks to navigate. I mean, we can't legally go above the civil service range, right? So our recommended comp is what it is. And we're starting the process to figure out if there is a way to update civil service range is how we can do that. They're already in the process of being updated because of the, with the CBA executions and the managerial raises, like titles are getting bumped. And so uh, the short answer is we don't really know how we're going to execute toward the bottom levels based on this, if, if they are outside civil service range. And we're doing that analysis right now and we'll uh, be able to come back to you with like a, a plan. But that is, we are aware of it. So this is just the comp comparable slide to the one with the headcount that just lays out the cost, um, the total corpus cost by team. And you can see the bulk of those uh, the, the, the expenses, obviously, in the uh, investment team. Or it should be. I think that's. I think that's it. Um, I anyway, just back to the issue to would be in addition to if you have filled each of the 39 vacancies. What we're asking for, what we put forward to you is total purpose. So the $10 million includes all the additions, our existing headcount, and any and the vacancies that are filled. It, it, it's a it assumes a fully staffed budget, a uh, fully staffed team. I have never in my life worked in an organization that has a fully staffed team. Never. Um, so but what happens if in the next year or two or three, we give you the $10 million increase in corpus and you still have 39 vacancies? That, you're not, we, so it's that, a- that, that they're in blue, which, which corpus is paid. Yes, yeah, right? so, so- that's incorporated. Yeah, so I want to be clear, budget and cash flow are different, right? So the, it, it's similar to when Patricia puts forward the budget. We have a personnel budget of, 10 point, of 28 million across the five systems. And then we only invoice for what is actually spent, right? So if we are unable to hire and fill all of the vacancies, you're only paying for what we actually hire for and what we have, and then the rest is not spent, right? So it's a... It's a budget max. It's not a. It's not a grant that you're giving us in advance yeah. that we do what we will. Right. Steve isn't going to buy a yacht with the extra money. <laughs> <laughs> Probably has one. Yeah. He's not there. So. He doesn't have a yacht. <laughs> it's a one bedroom neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, so I would just say the the one uh, this is the end of the presentation, and again, I think our hope is that we can take action on this next month, um, and um, so that we can begin the fiscal year. And if we need to, you know, obviously, many conversations between now and then, so that we can begin the fiscal year and start executing yep. and implementing um, the hiring. We can't do any more hiring until we resolve this. Okay. Um, can I, 
Um, let the record reflect that Tony Giordano. Oh, sure. Did you hear me? Um, Tony Giordano is now present. More questions for Steve or Allison or Kate regarding the recommendations coming from the Star Report. Thank you. Seeing none, I think it's an appropriate time to have a motion to go into the executive session. So moved. It's been moved. Do I hear a second? Second. And it's been seconded. All those in favor, any questions? All those in favor of going into executive session, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Extensions. We're now in executive session. We are back into public session. We will now have a readout, uh, and Fab McTeague will be doing the readout today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. During the executive session, the board received an update on performance. The board also received a manager update. The board heard presentations on a number of investment opportunities and consensus was reached on the investment opportunities. Details to be made public at the appropriate time. Yeah. Sorry, we were also supposed to, um, we were, we had discussed, uh, can we go off the record for a moment? Okay, so uh, thank you for the readout. Ed, and uh, I think we've concluded our business. Do we hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. And is there a second? Second. Thank you for the second. Uh, all those in favor of returning, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned.